have an exciting panel this morning. I'll introduce the first two speakers. My name is Yelden Gazit. I work for GYMS. Um, and we have two Chiswicks on the panel today. We had uh, a small conference last year with one of them. And uh, seeing as it was a great success, we thought we'd have another one. Uh, our first speaker will be Carmel Chiswick. She is a developer economist and a labor economist. She's currently a research professor at George Washington University. She holds a PhD from Columbia. Um, where she studied economic development and economic history. She has worked for, as an economist at USAID, the United Nations, and the World Bank. She frequently presents her research to academic conferences and community groups, and has held several visiting appointments at universities in the US and Israel. Uh, after her, uh, Barry Chiswick uh, will speak. He is professor and chair of the Department of Economics at Columbian College of Arts and Sciences at George Washington University. Um, he was a uh, University of Illinois at Chicago Distinguished Professor and Research Professor of the Department of Economics at the University of Illinois. He was department head from 1987 to 2008. In addition, he was Research Professor in the Department of Sociology and in the Survey Research Laboratory at UIC and Founding Director of the UIC Center for Economic Education. From 2004 until 2011, he was Program Director for Migration Studies at IZA and he is co-recipient of the 2011 IZA Prize in Labor Economics. We'll start with Kelman. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, let me see if I can adjust this. I'm going to talk about uh, one of the few areas where sociologists and economists share a model. I want the microphone to not block my view of this. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to, uh, we, the sociologists have been talking uh, in the last couple decades, really, about a religious marketplace. And they're talking about a marketplace of ideas uh, and they have developed something that they call the new paradigm. So I'm going to briefly sketch this, uh, this model. Uh, I'll start by telling you what the old paradigm is, and then we'll talk about the new paradigm, and then we'll talk about some of the implications of that for policy, government policy towards religion. In the, in the sociologist's conception of the religious marketplace, it's a marketplace for ideas, where different ideas compete with each other. Economists are uh, comfortable with that idea up to a point, but that marketplace has no price, there's, so there's no equilibrium. So what we do is we add to that idea uh, that we're not only competing for ideas, but we're also uh, uh, affected by the prices and incomes that we are that are uh, relevant, and so we come up with a market that we're familiar with. There's a supply in this market where different religions uh, compete with each other uh, for adherence, and different congregations compete with each other for members. Uh, on the other hand, in, there's also the possibility of a monopoly in which the state licenses a single religion to be the state religion, and all other religions are, uh, don't receive the benefit of state support. Uh, I'm going to use the term licensed because we're familiar with that when we talk about monopolies, but usually that's not used when you're talking about a state religion. Most countries have a state religion. Uh, there are a few that don't. Uh, of course, the notable one is the United States. Uh, and then there's uh, the market outcome. Uh, what we know about monopoly versus competition that's familiar is that uh, when you have competition, consumers end up buying a larger quantity and paying a lower price, not necessarily in that order. Uh, and monopolies, there's a, a less satisfactory outcome in terms of quantity. Consumers pay a higher price. The supply price paid by monopolists is somewhat lower because the output is lower. And the difference is monopoly profits, which in the case of religion, we talk about economic rent. But what we are talking about there is monopoly profits. 
Now, what is the old paradigm? The old paradigm was referred to as the sacred canopy, and that's the concept that underlies the, uh, the idea of a state religion. You have a head of a state, and you have a head of church, and I use church here generically because, of course, in Israel you have chief rabbi instead of the pope or the head of the, uh, the archbishop of Canterbury or whatever the equivalent is. But we'll just say head of church generically. Uh, they talk to each other, but each represents, the head of state represents the government to the church. The head of the church represents the religion to the government. Each of them has bureaucracy underneath them to carry out functions, delegated, delegation of authority. Uh, they hire specialists uh, for particular jobs. They have departments underneath them. And for, in most cases, it's from the central authority that the local uh, clergy are hired so that the local clergy uh, owe, some, owe their uh, salaries and appointments to the higher-ups in the church hierarchy. Uh, usually there's something comparable to that on the government side as well. Even if local authorities are elected separately, uh, uh, the, they, they get revenues from the central authority and there's a overarching legal framework that they follow from the central authority. So there's a parallel uh, bureauc bureaucratic structure uh, on ch between the church and the state. However, the two have a symbiotic relationship. The church provides a lot of benefits uh, to society that are inherently secular rather than religious. Uh, for one thing, the church legitimizes the government itself. But it the idea is that the sacred canopy gives a structure that promotes stability in the society, provides ordinary people with moral guidelines, but also they provide, they take care of the widows and orphans, they provide various uh, uh, good works, sometimes they will run hospitals or hospices, and often they're involved in educational institutions as well. Not just the training of clergy, but the high schools or even uh, preschools or, or even in some cases school systems for the uh, adherents. In return, the government supports the established church not only by providing revenues, and you pay in such a country, uh, but with your taxes, you pay taxes to the government and then the government passes some of these on to the church. But the legal system is supportive of the religious goals and the religious laws. The government not only enforces much of the religious law, but in particular, it enforces the monopoly. It keeps other religions out. And that's really the biggest benefit that the church receives. Now, what is the new paradigm? The new paradigm is competition, as distinct from monopoly. It's the separation of church and state, truly, in which the state really doesn't have anything to do with uh, privileging a particular religion. Competition is defined by free entry and exit of firms. Uh, and that's what we have in a plural, religiously pluralistic country. Uh, and I'll, of course, use the United States as my prime example here. Uh, anybody can decide that they have a new idea and they want to start a church. And whether they succeed or not depends on whether they can convince anyone to follow them. And if somebody, if they can get enough people to follow them, then they've got themselves a congregation and they're all set. I mean, nobody's going to stop them. Most of these congregations, like most startup businesses, don't last more than a few years or at most a generation or two because you have to be able to sustain this new group and this new belief. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of new religions that have succeeded, and we can think of the United States. There are the, uh, there's the Mormon religion, there's the Christian science, there's a bunch of religions that are actually indigenous to the United States. And there are older religions that were small dissenting groups when they first arrived in the United States that have grown into major religious groups. So you've got, and of course there are lots of religions that you don't hear about because they haven't, uh, they haven't persisted. In a pluralistic uh, uh, com competitive religious uh, uh, structure, uh, 
we have what we call congregationalism. That is to say, churches are not organized by any essential authority. They're organized by the congregation. People who want to join a church or form a church do so. The leadership of the church is a lay leadership. It's the lay leadership that's responsible for finance, finding financing for the institution. The lay leadership that is responsible for hiring clergy, for deciding a lot of the policy of the church, not only for, for secular uh, uh, dimensions like the financing, but also in terms of religion. And what, what do they want the religion, religious behavior of the church to look like? How strict? What, what kind of um, liturgy they want, et cetera. Uh, believers in different congregations compete with each other for clergy. Uh, clergy shop around for a good congregation, uh, uh, et cetera. Now, we have two kinds of institutions that grow up in that kind of a setting that are not actually congregations that you don't have when you have a state religion. The first kind of institution we call an umbrella organization. That's an institution where the members are not people but are, church, are congregations. So in, in American Jewry, we have uh, the United Synagogue of America, we have the United UAHC, the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, we have the Orthodox Union, and a couple of others. These are uh, groups, these are institutions where the congregations basically get together to solve common problems. They help each other with financing of clergy, for example. Uh, rich congregations can help poor congregations by, with a redistribution of income. Uh, they represent the religious group to the public or to the government that, when that's called for, if there's some sort of political action that's needed. Uh, they are engaged in religious education. They prepare textbook materials for the synagogue schools, for example. Uh, they, provide, they run seminaries to train clergy in the appropriate uh, 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 stream. So th these are the umbrella organizations. And the para-religious organizations are, in this in case of Judaism, it's Jewish organizations that don't actually engage in religious activities but are nevertheless Jewish. And the key, uh, the big ones are, are the charities, the social welfare, the homes for the aged, the care of widows and orphans, uh, the help to the poor. We can think of HIAS, which is the Immigrant Aid Society. Uh, they're just uh, all, the, all the fundraising organizations, uh, the, the United Fund, the federations in various cities. These organizations are Jewish. And they're motivated by religious principles, but their activities are not religious activities. Uh, so the umbrella organizations and the para-religious organizations are an extremely important part of the American Jewish scene that do not have their counterparts in, uh, let's say, in Israel, where you have a Judaism as a state religion. And the same is true of the Catholic countries and the uh, and the Scandinavian countries, uh, the, the, the umbrella organizations and the para-religious organizations are really only exist where there's competition because they're, the state religion takes care of all those functions when you have a monopoly. Now I want to add to this what people don't talk about too much is potential competition we know from our Econ 101 classes that even if you have a monopoly, if there's the possibility that if you price your goods too high, other firms will come in. Well, really, if you make too much profits, other firms will come in, and you want to keep them out, so you want to keep your profits somewhat lower than that threshold amount that will, keep the comp that will allow the competition in. Uh, but you have the same, an analogous thing, phenomenon in the religious marketplace, but in order for that to actually keep the monopoly profits down, uh, it has to be credible. That is to say, if the government swears up and down and you believe it that they will never license another religion, then it's not a credible threat 
and you can go ahead uh, and act like a monopoly uh, and, and with impunity. Whereas if uh, you really think, if you, if you really step out of line too far, the government's going to go ahead and recognize these dissenting religions, uh, then there is a, 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 a credible threat of competition and it will affect the monopolist behavior to the benefit of the consumer. On the other side of this coin, let's say you have dissenting groups. Uh, you, normally a dissenting religion uh, really wants to keep a low profile, really doesn't want the government to, to interfere with it at all. But uh, they do have, if there's a chance that you can get enough popular support to actually challenge the state religion in terms of influence, then uh, there is an advantage to organizing yourself politically and doing so, challenging the state religion and getting the state to recognize you instead of the other guy. So it's like any monopoly, right? You, a monopoly license can always be moved from one person to, from one firm to another firm. Uh, so there is an incentive uh, to form a political party that is based on your religion whose main objective is to capture the license from the government. Uh, and of course, the larger the monopoly profits are, the larger the economic rent that the state religion gets, uh, the greater the incentive will be for religious parties to form and try and challenge the reigning state religion. Now, I want to sort of end by throwing out some, some uh, evidence here. This is, it's not that the model of the state versus competition uh, is new, even in the religious field, uh, but it's just newly articulated by so social science researchers. And so I want to raise sort of your consciousness about precedents, uh, people who have written about this in previous eras. And of course, of this group, I'm starting with Adam Smith. Adam Smith has this wonderful passage in which he talks about dissenting religions in England in the 18th century. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, excerpts here. Teachers of religion, in the same manner as other teachers, may either depend altogether for their subsistence upon the voluntary contributions of their hearers, or they may derive it from some other fund to which the law of their country may entitle them. And here, he's, when he's talking about teachers of religion, he's talking about the clergy in the Church of England. Uh, their exertion, their zeal, and industry are likely to be much greater if they're paid by the voluntary contributions of their hearers than it would be if they were paid by the government, the, the fund to which the government entitles them. Uh, the clergy of an established and well-endowed religion frequently become men of learning and elegance, but they are apt gradually to lose the qualities, both good and bad, which gave them authority and influence with the inferior rank of people. Such a clergy, when attacked by a set of popular and bold, even though perhaps stupid and ignorant enthusiasts, have no other resource than to call upon the magistrate to persecute, destroy, or drive out their adversaries as disturbers of the public peace. Does this have a familiar ring to it, perhaps? So Adam Smith's England wasn't that different uh, from some of our modern uh, countries with uh, and uh, the state religion problem that he's talking about is clearly a problem of a monopoly uh, uh, driving out the, con uh, the competition. Now, another example of the precedence has to do with the American Constitution. The Ameri United States was really founded in a large, uh, uh, in an important way, by religious dissenters. And which religion they had really depended on which country they came from and which decade, because in Europe uh, it was always a state religion and state religions were merciless in their persecution of dissenters in most of these countries.
But the United States, when it was formed, was, considered to, was referred to as the great experiment. People didn't think, European thinkers didn't believe, that ordinary people could run a government. Right? One man, one vote was considered very radical, and they expected anarchy to be the result. And of course, we know what happened with democracy. It was a different kind of anarchy than they expected, right? It, but uh, the, the government itself was stable. But religious pluralism was also a foundation of this uh, new country, and that was also a great experiment. Without a state religion, it was expected there would be no morality. People would not be able to, uh, to order their lives properly. They needed a sacred canopy to be told what to do. And we know that in the United States, with competition among religion and no, no privileging of a religion, that religion flourished. So that the United States is a far more religious country than uh, its European uh, predecessors. And of course, economic capitalism, we know from Milton, uh, who articulated that so well, the free entry and exit of firms has led to a robust economy. So the hypothesis that chaos and anarchy would result didn't actually come to be. The metaphor that I like it came from, to describe this difference comes from architecture. Uh, the monopoly and the sacred canopy are like building a castle on the terra firma. It's solid. It's in one place, and it's fine unless there's an earthquake or a major change in the ground. The other concept of stability, the com competitive idea, is more like a ship at sea. A ship at sea is in constant motion with the waves, uh, but it's very, very stable. And it's a different kind of stable. And that's really, the, that metaphor, it seems to me, describes the difference between competition and monopoly very well in the religious marketplace as well as in the political and economic marketplace. And now I'd like to close with a, one more example of how new is the new paradigm. This comes from Devarim, Deuteronomy. And it's a quote that the conservative movement in particular likes to trot out when we're talking about religious pluralism. Uh, and it's a question of, will you have any kind of religious stability if you don't have a head of religion, if you don't have a state religion, if you don't have a chief rabbi to tell you uh, what's right and what's wrong. And in Torah, we are told at the, towards the end of Torah that, the, uh, that this Torah is being given to the Jewish people and it's not too difficult for you. It's not something that's up in the heaven that you need somebody else to tell you uh, how to interpret it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you need to send an ambassador to find out about it, but it's with you in your mouth and in your heart that you should follow it. And this is the, the uh, a way of understanding the value of competition from below. Thank you, Carmel. Uh, next up will be Barry Chizik. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. There'll be a change in pace in terms of how we approach these subjects. Uh, the, the title of this talk is Ordinary people and extraordinary outcomes, and um, about why Jews flourish in America. Let me just make sure I have these keys right. Where's my. Uh... Oh, makes sense. Okay. Uh, when, when people talk about success of, of Jews in the modern world, they frequently talk about 
the extraordinary people. And here's some data on Jewish Nobel Prize winners. Uh, the, in the, uh, the uh, six areas in which the Nobel Prize is awarded, and the percentage of the world total that were received by Jews and of the US total that were received by Jews, clearly extraordinary. And uh, in just surfing the web, you find all sorts of stuff, relevant and not relevant. And one of the articles I came across was somebody had an article about why uh, the awarding of the Nobel Prize has been discriminatory in favor of Jews and the Nobel committees have to change their behavior so that Jews would receive fewer awards. I thought that was sort of curious. But these extraordinary people are really not my interest. These are the extreme tale of the distribution. My interest is ordinary people. And I'm interested in how well ordinary Jews have done compared to ordinary non-Jews. And we're going to be looking at uh, male Jews compared with uh, white male non-Jews. And the, these are data from 1890. And actually, these are the people that were interviewed were living in the United States in 1885. <coughs> and they're primarily uh, German Jews. And you can see that <coughs> three quarters of the men were in clerical and sales jobs, sort of the stereotypical image of the German Jewish peddler and, and merchant. And then let's plunge ahead to the 1910 census where uh, Y means Yiddish mother tongue, so we can identify foreign born Jews and second generation American Jews by their Yiddish mother tongue. And what we see in 1910 is that the Jews were heavily involved in blue collar jobs, but the second generation was already moving into clerical and sales jobs. And these, of course, were uh, primarily Eastern European and Russian Jews. Uh, these were the Yiddish speakers, not, they're not the uh, German Jews that we looked at in 1890. And whereas most uh, people who are non-Jewish were engaged in blue collar occupations or in agriculture. If we jump ahead to 1940, again, we're using a Yiddish mother tongue or mother tongue of parents for identifying Jews. We see there's been a big jump in professional and managerial occupations and a decline in, compared to 1910, in the blue collar occupations, especially among the second generation among U.S. born Jews, whereas in the general population, the blue collar occupations dominated. So in the first half of the 20th century, these uh, Eastern European and Russian Jewish immigrants have already made substantial economic progress compared to white non-Jews in the United States. And if we go to more recent data, what we see is that about half of adult Jewish men are working in professional occupations. Uh, managerial occupations are also important, but the blue collar occupations have become very small. By the year 2000, and these data are from the uh, 1990 and the 2000 National Jewish Population Survey, uh, but by the year 2000, only one out of every 10 a Jewish men were working in a service or blue collar occupation, and the primary occupations were professional and technical, uh, with a substantial proportion in 
managerial and sales and clerical. But you had year 2000 about a little over half in professional and technical occupations. Now there's been an interesting development among these professional occupations. If we were to go back a few decades, you'd see that the predominant professional occupations were medicine and law. What has happened over time is not that medicine and law have become less important, but that other occupations have become more important. So there's been actually a spread, greater dispersion in the professional occupations held by American Jews. And there's actually an interesting story regarding coal plus you, college and university uh, professor occupations. Prior to World War II, it was dis discrimination against Jews in higher education, both in terms of admittance into educational programs and in terms of hiring as professors. Uh, there were some institutions that did not engage in this discrimination and other institutions that would uh, e e expect any Jews to uh, have much higher ability than the non-Jews and still other institutions that uh, felt that any Jew was too many. World War II gave anti-Semitism a bad name, or at least temporarily gave it a bad name. And the, after the war, one of the first institutions to change attitudes towards <laughs> Jews uh, was higher education. There still remained discrimination among the major law firms, still remained uh, discrimination in the insurance industry, except for insurance salesmen, there Jews were okay. But in terms of administration, you didn't have Jews. And uh, in durable manufacturing, there was an absence of Jews. But the first sector to open up was college and university teaching at the uh, end after the Second World War. And so you saw a influx of Jews into college and university teaching. And then as other sectors reduced their barriers, um, insurance, banking, durable manufacturing, and the like, then what we see is actually a decline of Jews going into a college and university teaching, decline of Jews seeking PhDs, because the PhD is really the union card for becoming a professor. So it's a little story about a particular sector of the economy, which I think exhibits well the adaptivity of Jews to the, the labor market and the finding of niches. So what we're seeing here is that the descendants of, oh, can I go back, Oops, no. The descendants of the great wave of Jewish immigration in the, from 1880 to 1920, uh, where the uh, immigrants and their U.S. born children were primarily in clerical sales and blue collar jobs. We see that their, uh, what I like is technical skills. <laughs> there we go. What we see is that their descendants have not only achieved professional status, but far more so than the non-Jews. So in 2000, professional and technical, 53% for Jews, and only 20% for, and this is white, non-Jews. Okay. Jewish successes. Why this extraordinary achievement? Well, it seems to me a large part of the story is the ability to identify and seek out opportunities and niches in the economy. 
this was an American economy was such that there may have just been discrimination in many sectors. But there were many sectors in which there wasn't that discrimination, and the Jews sought out those niches. And they invented or developed or enhanced new ways of doing business and new industries. And I refer to this sometimes as entrepreneurial skills, but more generally as decision-making skills and the ability to respond rapidly to changing opportunities. And we can think of retail trade and the development of department stores. And in the United States, if you rattle off uh, the names of the major department stores, uh, typically there was a Jewish founder, or if not a Jewish founder, uh, as in the case of Sears, uh, a, a Jewish entrepreneur who didn't found the company, but who greatly expanded the reach of the company. Uh, the garment industry and, and related industries, sometimes the question is raised as to whether the Jews made the garment industry or the garment industry made the Jews. If you think of entertainment, yeah, a little suspect, people in the entertainment industry, a little odd. Theater, movies, radio, television, very important sectors for Jews. And I just told the story of uh, PhDs and universities where uh, when an opportunity opened up, Jews went into it, and when other opportunities opened up, Jews sought out those other sectors of the economy. Why Jewish successes? Well, the short answer is, I don't know. But I'm willing to speculate. And this is my speculation. Religious and cultural emphasis on learning and study. And not rote learning, but analytical thinking, discussing texts. What does that really mean? And that sharpens one's analytical skills. It sharpens one's decision-making skills. And that's the second point, the emphasis on the analysis of texts. You know, one, knowing how to analyze situation is not something that we're <coughs> naturally born with, but it's a skill that we have to nurture and requires training and requires practice. And I think that the uh, cultural aspects and the way in which a text or studies in, traditionally in the Jewish community uh, honed those skills. Last night you heard Svi Eckstein's talk about edu education and Jews, and uh, there w was a lot of selectivity out of being Jewish because of the high cost of educating children. So are we talking about those who remain Jewish being a selected population? And was this a population that was self-selected for high intellectual abilities. There's been a lot of interest in recent years in genetics and in, uh, well, eugenics got, was another term that got a bad name, but uh, there's been renewed interest in the issue of genetics and the effect of that on uh, the human population. One of the things that I see in my research on not just occupational attainment, but also earnings among uh, American Jews is a rapid response to economic opportunities. Uh, Jews are a very mobile population, not just geographically, but also occupationally. High degree of mobility. And the simplest way of describing this mobility is this is the year 
2012, how many Jews today live in the same country that uh, their ancestors lived in in the year 1912? And the answer is very, very few. High rates of mobility. The ability to identify and seek out niches, I think has been an important Jewish trait. And I think these things are really possible, the seeking out of niches, it's really possible only in an environment that provides the, the freedom and opportunities to develop talents. And in spite of discriminatory barriers, to seek out those niches in the economy where the discriminatory barriers may be lower. They may not, there may still be discriminatory barriers, but to seek out places where these discriminatory barriers are lower than elsewhere. Uh, this last slide is all speculation, but nothing wrong with speculation. Thank you.